What's up guys, it's Rainhead back for another update video. I'm gonna follow up the video we did last time by describing how it is our game works today. When we left off, our cards, or items as we call them, had durability numbers that ticked down. The point of this durability decay was to make sure that a player's collection of items didn't grow indefinitely. If the player's collection grew indefinitely, the game just became way too confusing at a certain point, so we had to limit the total number of stuff players could own. Durability numbers also gave us another lever to pull to create more unique cards. Our cards are now permanent objects that stay on the board after you buy them. They stay in front of the players as they play, rather than shuffling between a deck and a discard pile over and over again. This let us increase our design space by creating a bunch of different timing triggers. Enter, leave play, when something happens, beginning of turn, end of turn, things like this. In order to give us even more design space to work with, we decided to have the items lock into position after you buy them. So it doesn't just matter which items you have, it matters how you position them. We can make a card buff the things that are adjacent to it. We can have cards that target the leftmost or rightmost card that you own. We could introduce effects that reposition cards around the board. All these changes made sense from a design perspective. We thought we would make the game a lot more fun. The first thing we had to do was redesign the game board because it was not made to accommodate all of these rules. Instead of a curved line where the cards would be fanned out, we needed a flat line on the board where the items could be clearly displayed. Our team started by making some black and white mock-ups for our new game board. After looking at a few different black and white sketches and different merchants and tweaking some sizes and things around, we ended up with a board that we were pretty happy with. And compared to the board that we started out with, this one is just so much more beautiful and simple, in my opinion. Uh, let's take a look at the original board we started out with, which looked more like this. And starting on turn one in the original game, you would have a deck, a discard pile, five cards in your hand, and you would see six piles on the board, two monsters here. It was a lot of stuff right out of the gate. So compared to our original game board, it was a lot less complex right out of the gate. And our players would start the game with a clean board like this. And as they play, they would see it get more complex and they would see items getting added to it. So it really felt like this was a lot more elegant of a rule set. And we're really happy with how simple everything ended up being after all of these changes. After we removed the costs on our cards, we realized that we need more elements to our items in order to have enough design space. We bounced around a few ideas and we eventually came up with a really cool one. In changing the rules of our game from this model to this one, we got rid of the varying prices on the cards in the store. And while this made the game more fun, we realized that, you know, it reduced our design space, kind of like we talked about in that design space video. So to counteract this and to add another lever to differentiate different cards from one another, we introduced card sizes. Because in the new model, you can only own items as long as they fit onto your board. So the size of a card was a very serious drawback for powerful effects. The size of a card was very important. Big cards would take up more space. Small cards would take up less space. Small cards could have weaker effects. Big cards could have more powerful ones because they have a real drawback to being that size. We are treating our board like a hand with a cap to how much you can hold at a time. In other card games, that hand cap is usually between five and 10 cards. Auto battlers or unit based games also had a limit to how many board slots you could have at a time, usually no more than 10. We decided to change this with a bazaar. Instead of having a hard cap on how many items you can have, we wanted to limit how much space you had. And it's up to you, the player, to decide which items you want to fit inside of that. This ends up working a little bit like mana cost does in other games, where more powerful cards that are bigger have more of a drawback because they take up more space. One thing I've realized is that arithmetic is just not that fun in any game. And the thing that I really love about the size mechanic is that, you know, unlike with mana costs, it's not represented by a number. You're not having to do math on which combinations of cards can you play this turn. Instead, it's using the spatial reasoning part of the brain, which is something that, you know, normally doesn't really come up in strategy games. This was an absolutely massive round of changes. We made the items stay in play after you bought them, completely redesigned the game board, introduced a size mechanic on different cards, 
and remove the deck and discard pile from our deck building game. Once we were able to play with all of these changes, the very first thing we noticed was that the natural decay of items is not fun. Each time a player uses an item, it should feel good, but we were getting the exact opposite feeling. Every item you used felt like it was melting in your hands because its durability would lower just by using it. When players got a really powerful item, they should feel like they got something powerful, but then they don't even want to use it because it just breaks as they do. The illusion of permanence is psychologically important to players. It doesn't matter how long their items actually last, what matters is that the players feel like their items are permanent. Our durability numbers felt like a big visual countdown to when your item would break. It was a very strong reminder that a player's items aren't permanent. We solved this problem by removing the durability cost to using the items. It was a pretty simple solution, but a pretty hard one to implement in practice. The reason that removing that durability cost on items wasn't easy to do is because it reintroduced an old problem we had, which is the boards would just continually fill up over and over and over again. When a player's board was full, they couldn't buy any more items. Buying items is like half of the game. You're in a bazaar, you're talking to merchants, you're, you're buying stuff, perusing stuff, trying to assemble a strategy. It sucks to miss out on the buying part of the game. Even though players would destroy each other's items sometimes, it wasn't something that we could really rely on. In fact, in some of our early builds, having your items destroyed felt good rather than bad. You wanted to free up board space so you could buy more stuff. We didn't really like this dynamic. It should feel good to destroy your opponent's stuff, and it should feel bad to have your own stuff destroyed. If destroying your opponent's items helps them, then people just end up going face instead, and that ends up being not nearly as fun of a game. We started to brainstorm ways that players could continue to buy items after their board was full. We called this board overflow. For board overflow, we had two main ideas that came to mind. The first one is what we call direct replacement. When you went to buy an item, you could just replace stuff under it. Now normally, our items in hand shift to the center of the board, like this. If I didn't have a full board, I would have an equal amount of empty space on either side of it. When a player would go to buy a new item, they could place it in between the other items they have because they would move apart. Kind of like uh, minion positioning in some digital card games. Direct replacement didn't exactly work when cards would move out of the way when you went to buy something. At first, we thought we could disable the items from moving around when you went to buy something that overflows your board. Since the items that players owned would center themselves on the board, this direct replacement system became kind of awkward because of this empty space on either side. In order to buy a big item, which takes up three slots, on a board that already has eight out of 10 filled, I could not put it here on this empty slot. It was weird why I could buy a big item, delete things that were under it, but then still have this empty space off to the side. If we changed the hand to stop automatically centering and we just had stuff fill in left to right, for example, then the player is always forced to remove their rightmost item when they buy stuff. Since we didn't have a clean implementation of this direct replacement mechanic, we decided to look for other solutions. We decided to try pushing extra items off the side of the board when new items get bought. This ended up feeling very clean to play with because now buying cards when I have a full board felt the same as buying cards with an empty board. You drag them towards your board, stuff moves out of the way, and whatever gets pushed off the side is just gone. If overflow is a regular play pattern, players have to care more about their board positioning when we use the pushing off model. We're not certain yet if it's a good or bad thing that players have to care more about their item positioning. How much they have to care depends on how often the board overflows, and that depends a lot on the durability numbers that we choose to put into the game. These last few questions about overflow are things we're currently testing. We're almost done with the core rule set of our game. It's developed a ton over the past few months, and we haven't even gotten into a lot of the spicier mechanics yet. This video is about showing you guys the basics, but I don't want you to feel like this is all that the game is. We'll save those for another update video. Make sure you sub so you see it. If anything stood out to you, if you think we could be doing any of this better, or if you just have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. We'll definitely check them out. And uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time.